the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you, God. So help me, God. Congratulations, Mr. President. And just in case you missed the speech, I want to take a look at some of the highlights now from the President's inaugural address today. My fellow Americans, we are made for this moment, and we will seize it so long as we seize it together. For we, the people, understand that our country cannot succeed when a shrinking few do very well and a growing many barely make it. We believe that America's prosperity must rest upon the broad shoulders of a rising middle class. We, the people, still believe that every citizen deserves a basic measure of security and dignity. We must make the hard choices to reduce the cost of health care and the size of our deficit. But we reject the belief that America must choose between caring for the generation that built this country and investing in the generation that will build its future. For we remember the lessons of our past when twilight years were spent in poverty and parents of a child with a disability had nowhere to turn. We do not believe that in this country freedom is reserved for the lucky or happiness for the few. We, the people, still believe that our obligations as Americans are not just to ourselves, but to all posterity. We will respond to the threat of climate change, knowing that the failure to do so would betray our children and future generations. Some may still deny the overwhelming judgment of science, but none can avoid the devastating impact of raging fires and crippling drought and more powerful storms. The path towards sustainable energy sources will be long and sometimes difficult. But America cannot resist this transition. We must lead it. We, the people, declare today that the most evident of truths, that all of us are created equal, is the star that guides us still, just as it guided our forebears through Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall, just as it guided all those men and women, sung and unsung, who left footprints along this great mall to hear a preacher say that we cannot walk alone, to hear a king proclaim that our individual freedom is inextricably bound to the freedom of every soul on earth. Who continued? I stopped, but who continued? Welcome back to our, uh, welcome back to our continuing coverage now of President Obama's inauguration. I'm wondering it, what, how you think that speech is heard by by Republicans <laughs> as opposed to by by progressives. I, I'm looking at Twitter. A lot of progressives are saying this is the president who we we uh, wanted to have, and I'm hearing from a lot of Republicans saying. That was a speech about big government. Where was yeah. the outreach, they're saying? Where was the outreach? Where was the concession? Where was the humility? Uh, but one thing that is different in the tone from the first inaugural address, some of the initiatives are similar or carryovers, but he's much more optimistic. We will seize the moment. He feel, You can tell he feels politically that he's turned a corner, and yep. he feels that economically the country is turning a corner. Not quite there yet. I'm going to get up and walk over, though, because he lays out this agenda, not in the detail today, but some ambition, but there are a lot of things that are going to make it really hard in a second term, and I think that's one of the reasons he was trying to capture the imagination of people outside of Washington, because he knows it'll be tough inside Washington. One of the reasons this is going to be hard for the president is if you just do this. Unemployment got up to 10% early in his term. But the unemployment rate today, this is when he started, 7.8%, 7.8%. So there's still a lot of work to do in the economy. But the president remembers these days. And he thinks he's turned a corner. And he's very hopeful that things are going to get better. One of the other things I want to talk about is the president talked again about how you have to deal with the big challenges. But he made a very clear statement. He was not going to sacrifice Medicare just to cut a deal with Republicans. The question is, what will he do? 
Because let's look at this here. Let's play this out. This is as the baby boom generation ages and retires. Here's where we are now, beneficiaries enrolled in Medicare. Look where it's going. Look where it's going over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Some president eventually has to deal with this because this is eating up the federal budget, eating up the resources the president wants to spend on education, wants to spend on roads and bridges, wants to spend on research and science and technology. So how he handles this, he was not clear today except to make a commitment to not hurt Medicare. But how does he change this spending trajectory without hurting the program? One of the things the president talked proudly about and one of the things he thinks gives him both political and some financial leeway is this. Troop levels in Iraq and Afghanistan, 180,000 when he took office. Just watch the trajectory, especially as the United States gets out of Iraq and now is preparing to get out of Afghanistan. About 70,000 now. The president hopes by 2014 that number is down completely. And as he talked about in the address, a decade of war will be over. But the heavy lifts, one of the things he talked about was trying to deal with gun control. These states that are highlighted, these are the states that have the highest deaths, gun deaths per capita. But here's the interesting part. How does the president sell Republicans and some conservative Democrats in Congress who oppose him, even though he has, by and large, the support of the American people? This is a CNN time poll. An assault weapons ban, semi-automatic assault weapons ban, nearly six in ten Americans are with the president. Still a very tough sell in Congress. That high-capacity ammunition clip ban, again, Nearly 60% of Americans still opposition among a lot of conservative Republicans and significantly conservative red state Democrats on the ballot in 2014. Requiring gun registration, that's one where the president might have a little bit more political strength. Putting armed guards in every school, that one drops a little bit. This is something the president has said should be left to the schools. The NRA says should be part of a national plan. It'll be interesting, given the poll numbers here, they're on the president's side, but the entrenched interest in Washington, not on the president's side. We'll see what he does there. One other thing I want to note, the president talked about how immigrants in this country should, not, should be allowed to go to school and then become the leaders of the next generation, not be deported. Well, remember, it was his administration. This is the Bush administration here. Deportations of illegal immigrants. It was the Obama administration that angered many Latinos, and especially Latino interest groups, by increasing the number of deportations. The president is hoping now that this actually gives him some credibility as he tries to negotiate an immigration reform package with Republicans. And Anderson, one of the things we have seen since the election is the Republicans know the math. They see the demographics of this country. They realize they have a crisis. They cannot be a viable national party if they keep getting such a tiny percentage of the Latino vote. So on the immigration issue, loggerheads with the conservative base, probably some common ground. On these other things, I think one of the reasons the president tried to be optimistic and reach outside of Washington is he knows on the nitty-gritty details on almost everything else, tough sell. Yeah, tough sell indeed. Uh, we got some new folks who stopped by for our panel. Jack Schlossberg, who's a student at Yale, grandson of uh, John F. Kennedy Jr., joins us, as well as Paul Begala, who is uh, much older. And uh, <laughs> Margaret Hoover, uh, CNN and, contributor and, Hitler, and Republican it. consultant. Uh, Jack, you had written a while ago uh, on CNN.com about the enthusiasm young voters yeah. had for President Obama. I'm wondering, as you listened to his speech today, what went through your mind? Well, I mean, one thing that struck me, a lot of the people around me were, you know, 20, not, you know, my age. And it was great to see, you know, everyone applauding when he talked about climate change, when he talked about equal pay, when he talked about gay rights. Those were the three biggest applause lines that I think that he got, at least from where I was standing. Um, and it really showed, you know, my generation voted 19% of the electorate. We were 19% of the electorate this last election and 18% last time. Um, and I think that, you know, coming out today, applauding for those lines really shows that we're committed to not only this president, but really that we understand that he he understands the problems that we we want to address the challenges that we need to face paul you had sp you had written in a daily beast article and, and we talked about it last night about what you thought the president should do and you said he should basically give lip service to reaching out but then go and be ruthless uh the, you know starting tomorrow what what did you hear were you happy with what you heard i, I was thrilled i, I was uh, th this president often slips into sort of airy fairy kumbaya Oh, we should all just get along. Well, of course we should. But that doesn't get you very far. He, he, did, he did just that. He, yes, he touched on it. He said the right things. But this was a confident, combative communitarianism. It was not political. It was not partisan any more than Ronald Reagan was partisan. It was philosophical. He said, our, the, Reagan said, the American myth is the frontier. Heading out alone, on our own, we don't, you know, the rugged individualist. President Obama answered that today with the wagon train, with the community, that we're all in this together. He rooted it in our founders, just like Reagan did with his myth, 
but he spoke for progressives uh, powerfully. And he, he, this is a man itching for a fight, and I'm sure the Republicans will accommodate him. But I have to say, I think this is what a second inaugural ought to be. He set the bar very high for himself, and now he's challenged uh, uh, himself and his party and, and our country to meet that. Margaret it's Hoover, from a Republican standpoint, did you hear what a lot of other Republicans seem to have heard, which is a call for big government? Well, it, it, look, President Obama always does this yin-yang thing. Well, on the one hand, we're a country of individualists. On the other hand, we're a country that depends on community spirit. And somewhere in the, in the middle, therein lies the wisdom, the truth. I think what Paul said last night is, Forget the overarching vision, you know, yadda, yadda, yadda. When you hear that tomorrow, don't listen to it. Remember you said that last night? And then just go for the political stuff. Well, I, frankly, that's what he did. I mean, this, I think, was an intensely political speech where he, he codified really important parts of the coalition, the Democratic Party coalition, and then grounded it in the American political tradition and in the context of the Declaration of Independence. In other words, he put the Democratic parties, he, like justified the Democratic Party coalition in the context of the American history and the Declaration of Independence. But this is a second term president. And he, it, it, to me, in watching him, it was like, we need to act now. I've only got four more years, by the way, and I want to get all of this done. Don't give me everything. I understand it, but you need to know where I am. I mean, my question is, his Democrats in Congress are going to be perhaps not as quick to do a lot of the things he wants but because the, they've got to run for re-election. He, He's the only guy who doesn't, the right? The other question, though, is where is he going to make the mark? I'm, it's not clear here. Is it immigration there reform? Well, is there it, are lots of opportunities. But, but it's it we the, that is the outstanding question at this point. Initially, it looked like he was going to push this year for a major tax and debt overhaul, and that would be his legacy of the second term. Now that doesn't that look changed. like that's going to be real. So now is it immigration reform? But does he have a Republican Party in partnership that will allow for a sweeping enough immigration package to make that real? Well, that's an unknown. But we didn't hear fiscal cliff discussion. The economy's going to get zooming. It We're going to be foreign. No, policy. It, it could end up being in foreign policy, drawing down troops, transitioning to this new kind of war fighting force with a drone warfare, sort of in keeping with what we're alluding to, Eisenhower. I, I, I think we're going to watch, though, two very different but equally fascinating dramas play out. Inside Washington, the Republicans still have the votes to stop the president on, on many things. They still control the House. They still have operational gridlock in the Senate, if you will, even though Democrats picked up. So inside Washington, the president has a challenge. But if you look at this speech, groundbreaking language on gay rights, back to climate change, gun control, immigration, and who that appeals to, as Jack just said, they have made a they doubling down on what they did in the campaign. They believe they have the coalition of the future. Young people, Latinos, African Americans, and they believe the Republican coalition is aging, in decline, and fractured. Mm. So they think politically they have the juice, and he's decided to play his cards. We've got to take a quick break. We are waiting for the start of the inaugural parade, of course. Uh, that uh, We are going to bring that to you live. And for one of the expected highlights, the President and Mrs. Obama walking part of that parade route. Join the conversation on our live blog at CNN.com slash conversation. Now here's another inaugural flashback. inaugural ball, Clinton grabbed the saxophone and played solo. That's a moment that would be remembered. LBJ, paraphrasing Churchill, said, never have so many people paid so much to dance so little. Grant's ball, it was so cold that the heat wasn't working right. They had to dance in their overcoats. And yet there is something about the pomp and circumstance that people love to look at the costumes. And even though some of the presidents thought it was better to not spend so much money on them, there's a, also a fascination as a spectacle to watch these things. This is my best friend. Just got back from a long trip. That just get weird? Yes. Kill him by 10 o'clock or you're dead too. What do you want to do until then? I could really party. Get down with it. Hey, no drugs at the bar. This is a prescription. I got the hypertension. <laughs> I'm retired. Nice work. Those are tense. I threw up in my mouth. Stand up, guys. Radar. In theaters, February 1st. 
Cholesterol-lowering statin drugs can reduce your natural CoQ10 levels, but your heart needs CoQ10. Take Cunol CoQ10. It dissolves completely and absorbs three times better than regular CoQ10. Get the better CoQ10. Get Cunol, the gold standard in CoQ10. This year, make safety your top priority and save hundreds with our best offer yet. Now extended due to popular demand. Get an ADT security system starting at just $49.